John Sargent, and welcome to Argumental, a show where the hottest names in comedy debate the biggest issues facing mankind. Issues like, can Iran be combined with Iraq to create one large, easy-to-hate country? <laughs> if the Pope is so infallible, why does he walk around in such stupid clothes? <laughs> and is Anne Robinson's face non-stick? <laughs> Here to argue such burning issues and others like them are our teams. In the red corner with Marcus Brigstock, this week, it's Sean Locke. <laughs> and joining Rufus Hound in the blue corner, please welcome Ben Miller. OK, let's kick off with round one, where we debate a big issue that's getting on all of our nicky-nacky nerves. Tonight, the subject under discussion is space. Space full of stars, satellites and the dead bodies of animals like these. We crossed the final frontier over 40 years ago, so what's left to see? Still fantasizing about life on Mars, we're spending millions on missions. And he's lost track of what all his new buttons do. No, don't touch that one. Whoops! And are the rest of us just so over the moon? So, space, it's a pretty big place. But the issue I want the teams to argue over is this. Space exploration is a waste of time and money. Proposing this statement on behalf of the blue team, it's Ben Miller. Now, right from the outset, uh, you could tell that space exploration was a waste of time. All that effort building all those rockets, and who do they get to pilot it? A monkey. <laughs> and it's not as if those monkeys have put those skills to use since. You know, you're extremely lucky if you can get one of them to pour a cup of tea or shift a heavy piano up a set of stairs. <laughs> there's no point going to space because there's absolutely nothing there. <laughs> Think about it, right? It's, it's called space. If there was anything there, it would be called stuff. <laughs> now, stuff would be worth a visit, wouldn't it? <laughs> I, I, I would pay thousands, trillions of dollars to go and visit stuff. I think stuff would be a place it's really worth hanging out in, but it's not called stuff, it's called space, because there's absolutely nothing there. <laughs> We've been to space, haven't we? And we didn't like it. Uh, we went to the moon. It was a massive letdown. Uh, you know, we were expecting cheese. Um, but what we discovered was a place that looked quite a lot like a disused quarry. Um, now, there is a use for a disused quarry, but who wants to go 250,000 miles for a spot of dogging? Um, <laughs> they're in tonight. Um, there are plans, of course, to use the moon as a launch pad for the exploration of neighbouring planets. But, friends, if we can't get people to live in Milton Keynes, what the hell are we doing going to Mars? <laughs> My final, most convincing reason is global warming. Thanks to the Americans, in 50 years' time, the surface of the Earth will look pretty much like the surface of Mars. And it will be a complete waste of time for us to <laughs> spaff billions of dollars travelling into deep space because we can just visit Washington. <laughs> and we can just stick a cocking flag in that and be really proud of ourselves. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to vote for the blue team. Thank you, Ben. OK, next up, opposing the statement and arguing that space exploration is not a waste of time and money, it's Marcus Brigstock. <laughs> In 1961, JFK stood in front of the American people as the space program had run into trouble and he said they needed $1.7 million to see it through. He said, we choose to go to the moon. Sure, with hindsight, that money would have been better spent on a car with a roof, but... <laughs> they chose to go to the moon and they got there. And now, thanks to their bravery, we are able to reach up and touch the moon face, something that until now was reserved for Sophie Ellis-Bexter's husband. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and 
Ladies and gentlemen, the space race is a wonderful thing. It's an inspiring thing, and if you don't think so, you are a space racist. <laughs> it's all about mystery. That's the point. We ask ourselves these questions and we seek answers. It doesn't matter if we don't find them. We ask, what's beyond the sky? We ask, are we alone? We ask, who is buying Peter Andre's album? <laughs> Someone is, NASA are looking into it, they're baffled. <laughs> Sure, there's less space exploration than there used to be, but that's because under the Bush administration, very few Americans are now able to count backwards. <laughs> what has space exploration given us, ladies and gentlemen? So many ordinary things we use in everyday life. The biro, Teflon, and Vernon K. <laughs> Who could honestly say it's a waste of time? You know, to get back in 1969 from your day at the office and say, what did you do today? We sent a man to the moon and we brought him back home safely. You have to be incredibly bleak to go, oh, bollocks. <laughs> did you? Yes, we sent a man to the moon. We landed him on the moon. Yeah, wagga. <laughs> yeah, you want to see a moon? Go on, land a fella on that. Yeah, go on, stick a fella on that. Bollocks. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, space exploration is wonderful. It's necessary. It's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of money. Vote for the red team. Thank you, Martha. So, Rufus and Sean, is there anything you'd like to say in support of your teammates? Obviously, the case for space exploration has been made very, very soundly by Marcus because without adventure, without possibilities, without hope, really, what's the point in being alive? Exactly. Other than wearing ridiculously long ties, which look fine. <laughs> fine when you're standing up, when you're sitting down, it looks like you put on a giant's tie. <laughs> It's only a matter of time before NASA develop a tie that, when you're standing, seems a perfectly reasonable length, and as you sit down, just retracts yes. in. <laughs> Thank you all. So is space exploration a waste of time and money? It's time for the studio audience to decide who made the best case. Hold up your blue card if you agree with Ben that space is a waste of itself, and hold up your red card if Marcus convinced you to reach for the stars. So blue for Ben and red for Marcus. Vote now. Space Cadets! <laughs> I think the tie pulled it round. <laughs> so that looks like a victory for the red team. Well done, Marcus and Sean. They've convinced our audience that space exploration is not a waste of time and money. In 2004, President Bush made a personal pledge that America would launch a manned mission to the moon by the year 2020 to find out once and for all where it goes in the daytime. <laughs> our next round is called Flip Flop, where we find out how well our teams can argue with themselves. I'm going to give one member of each team a statement which they must support until they hear this sound. <laughs> at which point they must perform a U-turn and argue against it, then flip-flop backwards and forwards every time I press the buzzer. Sean and Rufus will play this one. Sean, you're up first. I'd like you to start off by arguing that eyes are better than ears. Thank you. Of course, eyes are better than ears. When have you heard anyone ever say, oh, oh, she had beautiful ears? Oh, I could have looked into her ears all night long. <laughs> she had come to bed ears. <laughs> ears aren't an attractive thing, whereas eyes, they're shit, aren't they, eyes? <laughs> they are, they're rubbish. Because they're so, oh, delicate, oh, I don't like it, oh, I don't like the wind, oh, I don't like the sand, oh, I don't like the pen, oh. <laughs> It's not nice. <laughs> also, eyes are really good because uh, you take the piss, don't you? you? Take the piss with your eyes, don't you? You're like, what are you wearing? Like that. <laughs> what are you wearing? Like that. <laughs> oh, ears. Ears. Give me ears any day of the week. <laughs> Ooh, lovely, big, sexy ears. That's what I like. <laughs> if I had to keep something, an eye or an ear, I think an ear, people would, wouldn't be so freaked out because I said, look at my eye I've got. <laughs> I've got this eye here, they go, ooh. I've got, I've got an ear, they go, ooh, you're a cheeky devil, aren't you? <laughs> the great thing about eyes, though, is they convey so many complex emotions, can't they? Happiness. See? That's happiness. 
Sadness. I want to go to the toilet. <laughs> Whereas with ears, you've only got one emotion. What? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Well flip-flopped. Don't bother with a round of applause. He won't be listening. <laughs> Rufus and Ben, what did you make of Sean's performance? I thought it was all right, but he left out one very key point that without his ears, his glasses would just fall off and his eyes would be fucked. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Rufus, you're up next. I'd like you to begin by arguing that real men don't cry. <laughs> real men, of course, don't cry. I don't know, uh, this probably, you know, you look at me, I'm obviously clearly a namby pamby southern softy. If I shake the hand of a real man, like a builder or a scaffolder, sometimes, just the fact he's so real, those hands are so calloused, I actually make this noise. <laughs> <laughs> real men don't cry. Uh, but they should. <laughs> Even the obvious things, of course, uh, all men cry. Like getting your nuts caught in a zipper. <laughs> exactly. Even ladies will go, ooh, that oh, um, one. What do they expect real men to do? Not even flinch and just keep pulling. <laughs> no, of course, real men cry. Real men cry at the birth of their children. I was at the birth of my child and I cried. And not... I... But... I... <laughs> I, I, I cried, why have you done this to me? <laughs> and I don't know if you've seen a newborn baby, not a good looking thing. <laughs> beautiful though, beautiful, <laughs> not good looking, but beautiful. It's hard to explain that, isn't it? How can something be not good looking and beautiful? It's sort of like men seeing lesbians, but ugly lesbians. <laughs> Real men, of course, don't cry. Um, you have to be a manly man uh, to be a man, a real man's man. Uh, if ladies want to understand how a real man operates, think of the Terminator. Uh. That... And... and weep for him. <laughs> <laughs> weep for his cold machine logic. But no, he will never weep for himself. Uh. Why? <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> Well done, Rufus. New research claims it's healthy for men to cry and show their true feelings. And that's from a study by Professor Nancy Boy at Worcester University's Gaylord Institute. <laughs> Marcus and Sean, what did you think of Rufus's performance? Now, what I'm concerned about, mate, is, is how... You know, you talked about a real man crying when he shuts his balls in his zip. Yeah. How are you managing to shut both balls? <laughs> like, one plump. You know, anyone can make a mistake, but both balls would suggest to me such a lack of concern. I know you're on the same team, but yeah. he's quite young, isn't he? His yeah. balls are probably quite pert. Probably... <laughs> he's probably got the unisex scrotum. Right, yeah. Whereas I'm knocking on a bit. I mean, yeah. they're basically hanging out like executive toys. Yeah. <laughs> OK, time for the studio audience to decide who flipped and who flopped. If you thought Sean flip-flopped best about the eternal conflict between eyes and ears, vote red. But if Rufus had you welling up, then vote blue. So it's red cards for Sean or blue cards for Rufus. Vote now. <laughs> so, a blue majority there. Commiserations to Sean, but congratulations to Rufus. Join us after the break when we'll be revealing that this beautiful lady might not be all she seems. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to Argumental, the show that loves a good argument more than that alcoholic couple in the flat beneath me. Although the way he goes on, I don't blame her for sleeping with Tony. <laughs> right, next up is Slideshow. One member of each team will again be debating a controversial issue, but this time I want them to illustrate their argument using a series of pictures which they've never seen before. Marcus and Ben, you're up for this one. Marcus, I'd like you to start by arguing that smoking is big and clever. Here's your first picture. Ah, yes. 
Your smoking is big and clever. Stephen Fry smokes. He's big. He's clever. John McClure <laughs> happens to be big, but not clever. Now, to really nail this argument, ladies and gentlemen, this next picture is going to explain exactly what I'm talking about. Big and clever. Look at this. Uh. Right. <laughs> Of course smoking's big and clever. If you smoke, you'll get respect, you'll earn a lot of money, and you'll be able to afford lobsters every single night of your life. Your life <laughs> lasting approximately 20 to 27 years maximum. <laughs> smoking's big and clever. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's an example of a man who's not particularly big, but happens to be phenomenally clever. He started as an ordinary cigarette smoker, and then he started smoking marijuana, and he thought, <laughs> I wonder what that's all about then. <laughs> and sure enough, he wrote a brief history of time. You see how smoking can improve you as a person. You could be exactly like Stephen Hawking if you smoked. It's big, it's clever, look at the picture. <laughs> now these choir boys here are, are, are waiting with their mouths open. What do you suppose they're waiting for? The attentions of the choir master? I don't think so. These choir boys are waiting for a cigarette or a large cigar. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, smoking is big, it's clever, and it's cool. <laughs>
Someone I know caught his daughter smoking and made her smoke a whole packet. He had less success with that method when he caught her giving oral sex to a member of the rugby team. <laughs> It's on to our popular culture round now, where tonight's debate is about a confusing matter. Yes, it's the issue of cross-dressing. Why do we wear what we do? Why, for instance, am I sitting here wearing the classic suit, tie and French knickers? <laughs> we're all different. And of course, we're all pretty open-minded these days. So the issue I want you to argue about is this. Transvestites make convincing women. To help us really get to the padded bottom of the matter, please welcome tonight's special guest, the glamorous, the beautiful, the vivacious, Hugh. First up, it's Sean. Sean, meet Hugh. Hello, Hugh. Hello, Sean. Hello. <laughs> Hello, nice to meet you, mate. Oh, sorry, love. <laughs> Sean, you're going to be arguing that transvestites make convincing women. <laughs> <laughs> I rest my case. Thank you. <laughs> no, I, th I think transvestites do make convincing women. I mean, take me, for example. I think I make quite a convincing woman. I'm very feminine, especially when I've got my nurse's outfit on. No, they do. I mean, you look quite convincing, Hugh. Thank you. <laughs> it's my pleasure. You no, know, you do that. I mean, there's loads of other convincing tra transvestites out there, aren't there? Fiona Bruce. <laughs> He's done a lovely job, hasn't he? <laughs> and then, of course, there's John. Or, after midnight, he's known as Chantel. <laughs> I think the main question we've got here is, what is a woman? You know, it's not how you look, it's how you think, how you feel. Where you put towels seems quite important. <laughs> What I'm trying to say is, women aren't objects, are they? Women aren't objects. They're a constantly evolving, evaporating essence, aren't they? They're a mystery, like boiled eggs. <laughs> you know, if you look at someone, a woman, for example, a womanly type person like yourself, you, if you look, you're like a boiled egg, aren't you? When you look at a boiled egg, you don't know whether it's hard boiled or runny. Do you? <laughs> what I'm saying is, if you think you're a woman, you're a woman, aren't you? You know, as far as I'm concerned, anyone who goes into a lady's toilets is a woman. If you confidently walk into the ladies' toilets, I don't just go in. Unless you're, like, you know, changing their hand dryers or something, the towels. <laughs> and you work there, or a plumber. <laughs> Basically, anyone who goes into the ladies' toilets is a woman. And that is why <laughs> I think you should vote for the red team. Thank you very much, you. Well done, Sean. Rufus, you're up next. May I introduce you to Hugh? Hello, Hugh. Hello. How lovely to meet you. Thank you. Rufus, you're going to oppose Sean and you're going to argue that transvestites don't make convincing women. Well, as human beings, we're scared of change. We like the old certainties of women in skirts and men in sheds or garages. <laughs> but I would argue that Hugh is not trying to be a woman. He's neither a man nor a woman, but both at the same time. Opposing contradictory states. He is both penis and vagina. Lurking beneath this fetching frock lurks a sort of Schrodinger's twat. <laughs> <laughs> Ask any woman, and they'll tell you they hate being one. They hate each other, they hate themselves. Will he like me? Am I too fat? Am I too thin? Will he like me? Am I wearing the right perfume? Sisters! If you want a man to like you, you don't have to worry about height or weight or looks. You've just got to suck a lot of cock. <laughs> the quite important question, surely, is this. Who decides that these are women's clothes? When you think about it, we've actually got the entire system round backwards. Trousers actually fit a woman's genitals, whereas a skirt more comfortably fits a man. <laughs> so, if you want to argue for intelligent design, Look instead into the face of Hugh and feel the hand of God at work. <laughs> yes, he may not be a convincing woman, but he never tried to be. He is instead something more beautiful, more special and more deserving of our vote. Please, vote blue, vote for Hugh, I thank you.
Thanks, Rufus. Marcus and Ben, would you like to add anything in support of your teammates? I'm rather confused, because I would like this lovely lady here to introduce me to this mysterious Hugh fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever he may be lurking, because I see a whole lot of lady, and I like what I see. Thank you all. So do transvestites make convincing women? Once again, the studio audience will decide who made the best case. It's a red card for Sean and Marcus, who think transvestites are every inch a lady, and a blue one for Rufus and Ben, who may not agree, but do admit that a man wearing a miniskirt shows a lot of balls. <laughs> Vote now. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> so it looks like a win for the Blues. Well done, Rufus and Ben. <laughs> they persuaded the audience that transvestites do not make convincing women. Thanks very much to Hugh. I'm sure everyone will agree that you're once, twice, three times a pretend lady. <laughs> Hugh, everybody. Some of the most convincing cross-dressers are the ladyboys of Bangkok. They look exactly like beautiful women, but the giveaway is they never ask you stupid questions while you're watching a film. <laughs> At the end of that round, Marcus and Sean and Rufus and Ben are equal. <laughs> Time now for the final round, a last chance for our teams to show just how argumental they really are. I'm going to show them a series of images. All they have to do is suggest what argument the picture is proving. OK, here's your first one. I think that's an argument against putting your van in a hot wash. <laughs> is this an argument for Postman Pat's midlife crisis? <laughs> is it an argument for using traditional methods like sweets to attract children? <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Is it an argument for giving very clear instructions when ordering a delivery of manure? <laughs> and it's an argument for urban moles. <laughs> this is an argument against shit parking. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Next one. <laughs> That's an argument for photography. Is it an argument for checking what your wife means by a short skirt? <laughs> Certainly an argument that the going's just gone from soft to firm. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's it. So, for the final time, it's down to our studio audience to decide who made the best case. Red for Marks and Sean, and blue for Rufus and Ben. Vote now. So, I can tell you the red team have won that round, which means this week's winners are the red team. <laughs> well done, Marcus Brigstock and Sean Locke. Commiserations to Rufus Hound and Ben Miller. That's all we've got time for. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>